Um, yeah, just a quick raise of hands. Who in here either works for a software company or hardware company in any capacity? I feel like that's a few of you at least. Okay. What about a security, just a security company? Okay. And probably the security company may do some software development, maybe some security products. Okay. Well, good. Um, this, this talk you should get some valuable stuff from. Um, so I want to go into it because I've got a lot of slides and a lot of time, and I will talk fast. Real quick about me, been around, been around for a while in the industry. Um, again, I built up this project, project experience through uh, Microsoft, Amazon, now NVIDIA. Um, I'm a bug hunter at heart, so a lot of stuff you're going to see. Again, this, this presentation, there's going to be, um, it's mostly going to be high uh, technical stuff. That's, uh, that's why it's called a technical approach. When I look at a system, um, that's the first thing I think of, and then uh, sort of do the risk assessment as well. But um, yeah, this talk should give you some, uh, some insight and the different kinds of teams they are, how to do product security if you are sort of a smaller company just starting out in it, um, things like that. So if you like breaking stuff uh, and fixing stuff, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, skip the agenda. So fundamentals. Uh, first of all, with NVIDIA, I uh, just want to say it's more than a gaming company. I don't know if you guys have seen, but we're doing like autonomous cars, all this uh, cloud stuff, cloud gaming. You know, you've seen with cryptocurrency, mining stuff from there as well. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on. So before, uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, of course now there's a much bigger focus in security because we have a lot more uh, you know, customer-facing stuff to protect. So that's why we've had to evolve a lot in the space. Uh, and yeah, since I've been there, we've actually done a whole lot more stuff than, uh, than in the past. So one-on-one product security, and it's about managing risk. Um, I promise I'll get these slides soon. I just want to get that out there. It's, uh, product security is not just bug hunting. It's not just doing firewalls. It's not just um, you know, securing the perimeter sort of deal. There's a lot of things going on and a lot of different teams to do it. And what you're, most of the time you're doing is doing different kinds of R&D to, to mitigate and understand the risk and then uh, try to you know, go, go from there. So for example, I like this one because it's sort of, you know, everyone's seen the buffer overflows in the local program that you know, doesn't really make a lot of sense. That's because there's no risk there. So for this, you know, if, we, if we look at it in a way of, okay, we have a, you have a binary, obviously PDF to whatever, uh, you know, just on the local system, nothing else is going on, there's not a lot of risk there. You're not gonna wanna prioritize that in product security. Um, but maybe it's uh, a set UID root but there's a sandbox or something. Okay, well, there's a little bit of risk, but you still need another bug to escape the sandbox and all that. Then you go to local privilege escalation if there's no sandbox, and then uh, you got a web service that's calling PDF to whatever. Okay, now you got a little more attack surface. You got a remote uh, version of this. And then, you know, maybe the web server um, can handle users, not just administrators doing stuff. So now, if you find a bug in this app, you know, your risk is much bigger, and you're going to want to spend much more time on that product and do actual... Uh, you know, product security stuff for that. So this is, this is the sort of thing I want, I want to explain because that's why there's so much risk identification going on because you don't want to work on something that's not going to be, you know, make a difference in the, in, uh, in the, long, in the, in the vision of the product in the first place. So foundations. I want to explain a little bit about this too because, I mean, a lot of different teams are different. Um, sorry. Obviously different teams are different, but uh, <laughs> we have different verticals. Uh, so you can have like... Um, you can have security people in each group, uh, so you sort of like, uh, you know, you're stacking people in each group in that way. Horizontal, where you sort of have a, a central team that takes care of pretty much everything. And then most companies are here, they're in the hybrid. You have, you know, maybe you have like uh, some people in, the product, in a particular product group are security people, then you have a central team, then you have some other sub-teams as well, and you have, okay, this guy does security stuff as well. So most, most companies fit into that. You have different roles. You know, you have security devs that are building features. You got security engineers that are doing, you know, other kinds of reducing risk activities. You have SecOps, which is handling all the IT incidents. Um, you got pen testers. You got exploiters. You got researchers. I mean, you got all these different people. All this stuff going on, especially if you, when you have a bigger company, you have a lot more stuff to manage. So you need a lot of these uh, these roles to be, you know, ideally you want to be deep in them. So you know, hiring goes a long way as well. But uh, yeah, there's just a ton going on in a company when you're doing product security. So the overall you know, theme of product security, in, 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 uh, in um, my opinion, is you want to ship less bugs. That's what you're trying to do. You know, whatever, you're, whatever is going on, at the end of the day, bugs are going to be compromised. You know, uh, different kinds of risks are going to, different kinds of back configurations. All these things are going to um, you know, affect your customers, affect people using your product. Uh, you want to limit the blast radius. So when people do get in, you want to make sure they can't go that far. Uh, and then balance, you know, again, 
at the end of the day, you're selling a product, so you can't have, you know, 1,000% into security. You need to uh, balance that with, okay, we can do all this stuff, but we also need to ship the product. So, again, just managing risk from there. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, again, if you work at a software company, you probably are familiar with some of this stuff, too. Um, there's different ways to get stuff done in product security. Um, preferably, you know, it's kind of going from the top to bottom, which you'd like to do, culture. If you have developers who have a culture of you know, being proactive with security or reaching out to you and things like that, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, if not, maybe you have alignment. It's like, okay, you all should be doing this or we should be doing certain things to, to improve on this. And uh, sometimes you got to use escalation. It happens depending on your culture. If you don't have alignment, you don't have culture, you're going to be escalating a lot, which is not fun for anyone because uh, you want to not have an, you know, they call it adversarial environment in that way. So uh, whatever you do, always be nice. And uh, yeah, it'll get better. So models uh, for developers and and otherwise training. Um, again, there's there's different pros and cons for each one. Um, you can do training, but at the same time, you have to manage that well. Uh, Hands-on stuff. Uh, you can work with them every every step of the way for a lot of products, but that's going to take uh, a lot of people, and people are scarce resource. So you always want to scale uh, and opt in. So these this is one of my favorite ones too because. Uh, it requires culture, but at the end of the day, if you're able to you know, have secure APIs and stuff that you get developers to buy into and use, that's going to reduce a lot of your risk when you're shipping things. And, uh, but again, you got to get them to use them. you got to get adoption for that. And there's something too called like a mi minimally viable security bar. Um, so that's just something that you can set to of like, okay, here are the basic things before we can ship the product. Here's the things uh, you need to have done. And you can even, uh, if you have a product roadmap too, a lot of, a lot of uh, different teams, development teams do the things different ways, but if you're able to get a percentage of the roadmap focused on security, uh, that's going to go a long way too. Because at the end of the day, if they're like, oh, we'd love to do security stuff, but we just don't have time to do it. Well, if you have you know, a little bit, if you have a few tasks on your roadmap to do security stuff, you've allocated the time already. So that really, that's, that's a really good one to help fight that battle if you come across it. And then bug hunting. Again, you're just evaluating the assumptions in, in the products that are made. You're looking at, okay, you know, if they make the assumption that nobody should, should send this crazy amount of data, then okay, go check that assumption. Um, you know, all these different things go with bug hunting, and uh, yeah, that's what you're looking for. Uh, so security inside. I want to talk a little bit about doing it inside versus outside because uh, I had, I've had experience both. I've been an independent researcher, and I've worked at you know, large software companies. Um, so, when you're doing it inside, you got access to source code, which is pretty nice. Um, you know, you can do a lot of white box stuff. Uh, you can actually keep using the data to get better in a lot of ways. Um, outside, you're sort of like, okay, unless it's open source, you don't usually have the source code unless it leaks, and that's another thing which actually happens. Um, but if you can read assembly, at the end of the day, uh, you can figure out what's going on. So you sort of have the source in that way. And then disclosure process. There's a whole, you know, it's a whole different uh, ball game there as well. So perspective. I want to put this in too because this is this is one that you know uh, you have a lot of different companies doing security research. Microsoft's doing stuff. You have Google, Project Zero, and things. And you know, if you work for a company that um, that your software or hardware is affected by that, you're going to have to deal with it eventually. So when someone tells you you have bugs, um, you know, there's there's this culture around, uh, you know. You are part of the company. You're sort of defensive automatically in that way. You know, you're looking out for the company's best interest. But at the same time, uh, it's a lot more proactive if you're just like, okay, we need to take this data and get better with it instead of just being like, oh, they're picking on us or something. It, it, take the emotions out of it. It's, at the end of the day, you want to be productive. Um, so that's the message there. Um, so again, for vendors, um, there's a lot of assumptions that... Uh, um, that are made that are not necessarily true. So just anything, assume anything that uh, people can do with it, they will. And you wrote the code, so at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to fix these bugs as well. And for reporters, I mean, the biggest thing you see sometimes is, is folks complaining because you know, it took so long to fix the bug. You know, obviously, years are unacceptable, but at the same time, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the company. So prioritizing your particular bug over you know, the other potentially 50 that are back there is a little interesting dynamic to work with. Um, so just some, just some points on that. And then mindset, just thinking that it's, you know, sometimes you hear, oh, you know, we're not, we're not sure if we should look at it. You know, we're not sure if it has bugs. What bugs could it possibly have? 
Well, just think it's vulnerable until you have done the work to see that it's not. If you do that, you're going to be able to cover things much, uh, much broader in that way. So, sorry, I'm skipping over slides a little bit because I have quite a few, uh, but obviously they will be available offline as well. So, if you're able to map the notion if, of not doing security, especially if you're a smaller company and maybe you're at a startup or something, you haven't got to deal with security uh, folks that often yet, maybe external research and things. If you map that, you know, for, for leadership-wise to, you know, not doing security is actually a risky business. You know, there is, if you map it to a liability, instead of, well, security would be nice, but we really can't afford it right now, uh, that's going to help improve the process as well. So when you're interacting with developers, again, I know some of you raise your hand because you uh, work at a software company, whether you're doing security there or not, um, you know, it's not enough to just point and say, this is broken. Um, I mean, so you, the biggest difference, I, again, working with, like, if you're doing consulting and you're doing pen tests for, for companies, um, you know, usually at the end of the day, you do the work, you present the report, you, know, you give them the findings, and you leave it up to them to do whatever it is, uh, how they want to manage that risk. But with, um, if you're working in the company, you're going to want to be a little more, you're, you're essentially an extension of the developer team. If you're not on the particular team, unless you are, which you can be, but if you're on the central team, for example, you are an extension of that product uh, when you're doing security for it, or at least you should operate in that manner. So um, each thing you describe should, should come with a solution. Uh, you shouldn't just point things out and say it's broken. You know, come up with some ways to mitigate it, mitigate it away altogether, use tooling, which I'll be talking about in a moment to do that. Um, and that's going to build much bigger relationships with your team as well. Um, there's a ton of strategies here. Uh, one, integrate with the dev process, of course. Uh, I mean, robots are going to replace us all one day, but in the time being, we can help them, I guess, would be my point. <laughs> um, you can insert either people or, uh, or uh, tooling in the code repos and, and get those type of uh, code checkpoints there. Um, you want to make security easier for the product team. Um, you know, there's a, there's a phrase called like developer self-service. Uh, we use sometimes in, in, uh, in product security where you're able to, you know, if you only got a few people on the team and you want to um, comprehensively take care of a lot of different products, you're going to want to give them tools that they don't have to reach out to you to get a review every time. You can just give them something and help them um, get the review either themselves and say, hey, let me know if you need help, um, or just a way to make it faster and easier for them to do it. And that's usually not around a lot unless you spend a lot of time doing uh, that particular aspect. And don't make it optional. Um, that's a big thing, too, because if there's ways to get around security, I mean, it's, it's obviously developers are developing stuff, and that's what they should be doing. Um, so they're going to focus on that. That's going to be the priority. So if you make it optional and you make it easy to opt out, uh, or you just don't make the process comprehensive to cover everything, then you're go not going to get a lot of coverage there. So having a secure by default, holding people accountable, uh, having different gating systems for that is going to help a lot too. And just devalue things where possible. I mean, attackers don't go after stuff that's worthless. Like, there's got to be value there, or, you know, it, let's say 99% of the time, I'm sure some of them are just having fun, uh, which may, those are probably not the ones you're going to worry about anyways, but the ones who, you know, are going to uh, perform these things, they're usually going to want to steal something of value. So if you're able to not collect certain data, or if you're able to move data that's valuable away from a particular network, which is exposed, things like that, um, that's going to help out a lot of, as well. Even if you do get compromised, they don't get anything that's that valuable. And then the finish line, uh, you can have something where, you know, um, you, you uh, something standard across all your products of, okay, do you have a threat model? Do you have stack analysis? Do you have anything going on security-wise? anyone ever looked at your product? Has anyone ever heard of your product in security? Um, those are things going to help you um, manage the process as well so you don't ship something. And then a few days later, get a report saying, oh, there's all these bugs. And it's like, oh, that, another one slipped through the cracks. So uh, coverage is a, is a big thing here. And being effective, that's, that's something... I think the whole theme of the talk, I would say, is just being effective in product security. It's, it's actually more difficult to do than it sounds. It's like, okay, be effective, be productive, be, um, you know, do things that matter. That's a lot easier to say than it is actually do, because there's a bunch of different intricacies within the company, depending on the culture and depending on the things I've discussed before. Um, so you, you have to scale yourself. I've, that's one thing I've learned is you can't just be you doing all the security stuff. You have to either create tools to do it, uh, you have to uh, hire really well to do it, 
Um, you have to get the culture involved and let them let, let the product team handle all this stuff, get them in a way where they can do that, um, because you can't do it all yourself. And again, more, more security and hardening generally means less bugs. You can sell that to a team saying, okay, you're not going to get randomly paged at 4 in the morning because there's some issue. You're not going to um, have all this work later on that's going to build up because we didn't do the work up front to make sure you have less bugs when you ship. So, and, and get data where, there's, where, where possible. Um, these things can help you drive initiatives. I know it's sort of a whatever word, a hand wavy thing, but having data to back up what you're doing is going to help you make the case uh, a lot easier to people when you do that. So, I said all that to get to tooling and automation. So, there's a ton of things. Um, you can do here. I've generally broken it down to static analysis, dynamic analysis. It's not really the best way to put it because some of them overlap. Um, there's a ton of tools that don't really fit in between, which I've sort of thrown in the campaigns in the later section. Um, but that's sort of the, the gist of things uh, at this point in, in, in ProdSec. So static analysis, you want to automate code reviews wherever you can because, again, some of you, if you work for a software company doing security, You've probably done a bunch of different reviews. You probably, you maybe that's your day to day is just doing reviews. You're looking at code, things like that. You know, a finely tuned tool is much better than a team of code reviewers. It scales much better. You can, they can be using their time not to get burned out just reading stuff all day. Um, and again, spend your time writing um, or skimming more than reading, um, unless you're a super super good code reviewer, and then maybe you should be reading more often. Uh, and then make a run every time. Don't just do it once, check box, okay, we can ship. Put it into the build process, make, it, make sure it's running every time so you can keep getting that data each time on you know, what's going on. Did we commit some more bugs? Um, you know, did, did something break? Did, we, did some um, dependency we introduced uh, introduce a bunch, a bunch of new things we don't know about either? So that, ha having it run every time is going to give you the coverage and not just the uh, point in time check. So some ideals and tools uh, that are out there to do this. Um, there's a bunch of different IDE plugins. Uh, I kind of want to start at like the the you know the whole process of like okay, what do you do when you develop, and then what do you do when you ship? So it's going to start at the lower level. Uh, just something that can tell you at, or tell the developer when they're writing code, hey, this is maybe not a good idea. Like there's things that tell you uh, IDEs normally tell you or warn you about deprecated functions. They warn you about um, various other things. But having something to tell you about security bugs is actually very useful and and there, there are some things around this. Uh, it's called annotating or linting. Uh, so you can write specific rules um, for your code to pick out bad patterns. And, and before they even commit the code for you, they even test the code. You can let, uh, they can get um, either warned or they can, you can make it you know, error out on compile as well. Like, hey, this definitely looks like a bug. You, know, you didn't give it a format specifier. Um, you pr should probably do that unless it's a static, you know, all, the, all this stuff. So. Uh, there's a lot to do there that a lot of people don't focus on as well in the ID uh, part of it. Uh, and there's a ton of telemetry opportunities. Uh, just, just going back to the data part, like you could build a system around that. So every time you see, uh, you know, maybe uh, you have a developer who keeps, you know, committing this particular bad pattern, disregard the other ways you can find that afterwards. If we want to find it beforehand, um, you can have an IDE plugin that is uh, sending, you know, that when it hits this particular pattern, it's sending up to a database somewhere, and then you can count, like, okay, which of these patterns are, do we keep doing over and over? Which ones can we just not stop um, getting wrong? And then you can do training around those patterns to be like, okay, we see, we have the data that this keeps coming up. Here's what's the problem here. Here's how you can get better at it. And, uh, and just use that telemetry in that way, because um, that, that's how you get data especially on the software side. And of course, you can ban dangerous functions. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do this with headers. Uh, you can have it throw errors when it compiles. Uh, you can do GCC poison, which is like the old school way of doing it. Um, and LeafSec has some, uh, has some documentation on that as well. Or you can just deprecate the function. Um, and uh, you can typically find a lot of bugs too just by parsing build logs. And there's all kinds of warnings and stuff that are in build logs where you can f actually find vulnerabilities just looking through the logs. Easy wins. Uh, you can gate the code, as I mentioned earlier, uh, something where before it goes through uh, and goes to the build process, uh, you can automatically kick it out. I mean, a lot of companies do this already. Um, Git makes this a lot easier with uh, the commit hooks and stuff. 
Um, so you can do it client side, server side. So you can either push it down to the dev environment client side, uh, or you can have it on the, uh, the the other side and scan things as they come through. Say, hey, you know, we know this is with a high confidence. We can see this is a very bad code pattern. Uh, we're going to kick it back out. Can you try it again? You know, go to our go to our wiki that shows like you know how many times we've seen this and uh, how you can fix it. So another telemetry opportunity, of course. And the source binary diffing. This is one that I don't hear a lot of people talk about either. Is is when you build the code, like how do you know the source code is exactly uh, you know mapping what the what the binary build is? Um, I think there was a good talk uh, maybe a few years ago at Recon about um, sometimes compilers do optimize out uh, security checks. It happens from time to time. How do you know that? Like, at your company now, do you know that what you're building uh, doesn't have some checks knocked out that may affect security at some point? Uh, so having something that can compare the two, you know, definitely there's some tooling ideals for that, um, can, can help you get better in this area. And of course, you know, the reverse engineering part of your threat model, again, assume someone's going to reverse as soon as it's out there. They don't need the source code. Uh, and the scanning code upon build. So another easy one for uh, for scanning code. You can hook into code repos. Um, you can have scanning that does on demand. Uh, you can have it do every time. You can use it for your security team or your development team. Um, you can take it uh, and have a big bug bash before uh, before the next release as well. So some people enjoy those. And subscription for code changes. This is something I like too. You know, being a security engineer, having the ability to um, Subscribe either to a file or a directory or a pattern uh, or a developer even if you know there's a particular developer who's who keeps committing uh, a lot of interesting things and you want to follow him in that way uh, him or her then you can subscribe to code changes um, and you can if you just know like through your PSERT program or you keep getting externally reported bugs where you can come up with patterns for those bugs simple regex whatever it is. Um, throw that in your subscription, and now every time somebody commits, you know, a mem copy using a user specified length, you get an email, and now uh, you can go make the code better. You know, other ways as well. Uh, different things with hardware attacks. So a lot of ways uh, with with glitching, for example, you can have a tool that uh, automatically runs the critical code through through a uh, redundancy adder tool in that, in that way where it can uh, pick out particular patterns where it would be valuable to make the code redundant and then automatically insert those and then have someone review that you know, of course, uh, afterwards, of course, because it's a critical code path and make sure it makes sense. Uh, but that can automate a lot of the uh, different glitching mitigations as well, just inserting redundancy at, uh, at different points. Uh, variant findings. So this is, this is another one, too, where you can, uh, if you have the data, if you have the um, different patterns or whatever it may be, uh, where you can just give it to the tool and then say, go find me more of this pattern. Like, here is what vulnerable code looks like for this particular bug. Go see, you know, before I fix this bug and go ship it to the customer, go look to see if there's more instances of this. Um, so you can definitely use that for PCERT. Um, that's a huge place where it'd be useful because when you're fixing bugs and you're doing it and you're releasing the patches externally, you don't want the reporter to come back and say, oh, you know, there's another bug over here. Why didn't you fix that? You want to have a more complete patch uh, and make sure you find all the bug, fix all the bugs, not just the one reported. So I have a diagram on that one as well. Um, yeah, so you're going to start seeing a few, few more diagrams than these, where, yeah, essentially, like I said, you just give it a buggy code snippet. Uh, maybe it's a mem copy of something. Okay, you know it's vulnerable. Um, you put it through a variance engine of whatever algorithm you want to use that will. Um, you know, find similar ones, and then it pops out. Okay, there's another mem copy down here that has um, a similar looking. What was this one? P buffer, P state. So that one's P com. It found P state, P dat, uh, and another file found P name. So maybe if those are in the same case, they're in the same code format, whatever. Um, you just found some more bugs um, in addition to the one that was reported. So you can fix those, make the product much better. Uh, and machine learning. If you have the bug data, why not make it work? And that's what we're working on. So next time, I hope to talk more about that. So product DNA. Um, that's something that's really interesting, too, um, because again, if you're developing software, you're probably not reinventing the wheel for everything. It doesn't make a lot of sense business-wise or logic-wise. Uh, if you can use open source stuff, it'll save you time. Go do it. Um, and a lot of companies do this. but what happens is now you add a dependency, first of all, you increase your attack surface, and you also take a, um, you have to do maintenance for the package. 
Um, so right now, if you're thinking of your products, it's like, okay, do we know if we're running? Like, how do, how do we keep track of these things? How do we keep track of the OpenSSL version that we're shipping? How do we keep track of all these other dependencies that are probably going on? What if the maintainer quits? What if, um, you know, the code forks? Like, all these different things. What about the security patches? Are we taking them? Do we choose which patches to take? There's a lot of complexity on that. Um, just adds to anyone who, like, you know, forks Android or, or, uh, or OEM vendors for that. It's, it gets pretty crazy. So you want something to track a lot of this stuff and see when it changes. So, for example, you have a system where um, you have a server that just has, uh, that goes through and you sort of plug in tools where you have an open, open, uh, open source tracker. You maintain a list of all the versions of, of all the stuff you have running. If new stuff gets added, you pick that up as well. Every time there's a build, you, you see what, uh, what your code is actually uh, uh, made of in that way. And then you have something to uh, report for that. Maybe you notify the developer who, who made the commit for that code, whoever that owns the code. Um, whatever system, whatever process you have in place to make this, uh, to take care of those dependencies, um, you have something to track it now. And that's something valuable. If you didn't have it before, um, you probably have an Excel spreadsheet somewhere doing it, which is not, not the best way. To, any, anything that involves an Excel spreadsheet, you're probably not doing it the most efficient way. So dynamic analysis, that's all the static stuff, all the different tooling you do with that. Um, as I said, uh, the categories aren't the best, but uh, bear with me. So dynamic, uh, nothing like running the code. So you can do a lot of stuff here, obviously. Um, even with sanitizers, easy one. Turn on sanitizers on your code. You'll get free bugs. They'll just be there. They'll just go test your code with sanitizers on. You'll get free bugs, like free tip right there. Um, another thing you can do, you can reuse unit tests to create fuzzing tests. Um, you can essentially have something that um, has, there's a transform layer, and you can just say, okay, here's my product, I have a bunch of unit tests, I want to have security tests. Well, how do you do that? Another way, uh, another way to scale yourself. You know, if you have a tool, you can give developers that just takes uh, the unit tests, runs it through a mutation engine of some sort, um, you know, it turns... You know, say you have some network protocol, it's using parse packet, blah, 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 and you turn it into um, Satan. Now you turn it into, like, doing a bunch of uh, stuff that'll trigger crashes. So you're essentially, you're creating fuzzing tests by just reusing uh, what's already there, uh, which is really economical for one, and for two, um, it, it seamlessly integrates with your build system. Because every time you, build a, you make a fuzzer, uh, now, and you want it to run every build, now you have to do a bunch of glue for that. Uh, if you just have something that looks just like a regular test, except it does um, not function testing, it does fuzzing, it does other kinds of security tests, uh, now you have something you can give the developer and say, hey, just point this as your unit test, it'll automatically add it in, and you can you know, do fresh ones every time, all that, um, and it'll work. So, good way to automate with that way. And then a fuzzing lab. Um, if you're not fuzzing, someone is. So, it's much easier if you, you know, do the fuzzing yourself, Find it first before you ship the product, obviously. Um, and you can do this. It's, it's actually not that hard to do. It's something you just have to, um, you know, you can build a platform um, and you can just have a plugin based system where uh, you're just able to add different fuzzers. If you have internal, internal ones, you have AFL running, whatever it is. And you can have just have developers uh, use this to uh, get fuzzing running, start jobs up, make it run every time, all that. So. You want to make fuzzing easy to do? Um, do a platform to do that. So one way you could do it, uh, if you have a web UI, you could have again the developers or yourself. Jeremy, in, just just in case uh, we're having lunch as well, can you round oh. off your talk because we're over time already? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? No, the question is, uh, are you still going to take long because we're over time and lunch is served, and otherwise the whole program will get messed up. Okay. Do you want me to? Uh, Stop? Or? Yeah, well, if, if there's a natural point to stop, it okay. would be great. Okay. Um, <laughs> how many minutes do I have left? Uh, none already, like you're minus five or something. Really? Okay. Um, I will run through some slides then. Um, so, different stuff you can do, subsystem diffing, uh, what happened before and after uh, to see what changed and what you need to take care of and what new attack surface you have. Uh, auto isolation, each app you can go through and... Um, you just need the bare minimum of stuff. Uh, you can restrict it based on a configuration. SetComp does this if you ever worked with that. Or you need to do this for SetComp to, to limit the number of system calls. Um, different campaigns you can do. Attack surface reduction. Um, 
you know, if you have a bunch of, uh, if you're forking a bunch of stuff or have a bunch of systems that are running on some uh, OS that you're, you're basing it on, turn off all the stuff uh, that you don't need beforehand. Um, build a knowledge base of stuff so you can just get people links instead of re-explaining uh, security ideals every time. Uh, bug bashes, door knocking, have something always scanning the system um, that will be trying to brute force stuff. It'll try and, uh, it'll let you know when somebody adds that user that they shouldn't have added, and things like that. Uh, hardening API is a big one. Uh, you know, you can wrap APIs to to make sure there's never it's guaranteed to have no bad data go through the APIs before it hits the real one you want to hit, um, and then have a way to they can bypass if they need to. Uh, do pen testing, do red teaming, do training, do some other stuff. Mentoring is very important. And inclusion. Uh, culture, do stuff that matters. Uh, don't just run around on a computer. Be effective. Hope I've given you some ideas to do that. Uh, have an open mind. Um, again, externally reported bugs are randomizing, uh, but use them to uh, be more productive and uh, use them as a way to explain where you need to go deeper in your products to, to get the bugs out because you have the data externally. Um, and then uh, constructive criticism is healthy. It's okay to make mistakes, but be teachable, accept feedback, and uh, make sure the same things don't happen twice. So in closing, uh, we discussed most of the tools and techniques uh, to help you ship less bugs. Um, there's definitely a lot to, as you can see, there's definitely a lot to uh, doing product security if you're going to be comprehensive, if you're going to be effective, if you're going to um, be able to cover all the stuff you need to do. There's a lot of stuff going on. And work on what do you think is valuable. And make sure every solution you have, or every problem you find, comes with a solution, because that's more valuable than just the problem pointing it out. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. So for Thanks. questions, please.